Bible says that the river of God sets my feet of dancing. The river of God is something that springs up, is refreshing inside of us. Seem a little tired this morning, maybe a little bit of a crazy week. We jump in the river for the time of refreshing in our spirit. We set everything aside and we ask just the spirit of God to rise up with inside of us and refresh us and encourage us. And so we wanna encourage you this morning to just, as we sing, as we worship, as we dive into the word of God, to remember that there is something that is out there that can refresh our weary soul. There is something that is out there that can just be uh, an encouragement to us, a refreshing to us. Just like on that hot summer day and, and, and you're roasting and you're tired and you jump into that pool and it's refreshing and you're able to just feel good, it's about being in the presence of God and not just feeling good, but knowing that it's good. And that's what we want to remember. And so I want to encourage you as we continue through worship, just uh, continue in that mindset that knowing that God is that one that allows us to just have the freedom to be here to worship and that allows us to jump into his presence and into the river. So this morning, find someone that you don't know. Find someone that you do know. Say hello to them. Greet one another right now as we just spend a couple of moments uh, in fellowship with one another. Hey, Oh, yeah, so I don't know if it's back there or here. So I don't know if you want to. Yeah, hey, I'm going to talk. Yeah, I can hear it. It's going to be in my ears, too.
Good morning. We're going to take an offering if the uh, ushers would prepare. I'm going to read a verse from my old Isaiah. Oh, Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name. For you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. So it indicates God has made some plans long time ago, some, some of them before we were even born, but God is faithful to commit to those plans, and you have may, many here may have experienced that already. I know we, some, sorry, we have a fine group that takes our offerings every Sunday, and sometimes I was thinking we really don't see the big picture, and it brought to mind because of the uh, missionary we had a couple months ago, Pastor Jesse Cumrey, as he spoke about many of the places that he had been and the lives that he had touched. He had special talents, but he allowed God to use those talents. Uh, and he had a word of God and a presence and the knowledge to speak those into the lives of others, which opened many doors. He had a large presence, but he was able to enter in places others couldn't because of the word of the Lord that he carried with him. And... Uh, I think of the many families that he touched, and I remember afterwards we took, took a love offering. So many of you folks contributed, and we sent funds out with him. They'll help him carry that message to further places and touch more and more families. We have missionaries in the field today with technology and, a techni techni yeah, technology and, and support that they haven't had before. And they can, for example, go into villages where they say there may be no water in the villages. People are having to carry water for miles around. And they have the technology to bring in equipment in and dig a well and place water within that village. And they may not seem much to us because we turn on a hot water spigot every day. But if they have no water, they suffer physically, mentally, and spiritually going without and to bring water in and touch that many lives to say, well, how did all this happen? Well, there's a church up in Altoona to help contribute and bring water because God fulfilled the promises that he had long planned. We had a group of men that go down to, went down to Cuba at the beginning of this year in February. And, yes, uh, they brought some funds with them for the church, but they also brought the gifts that God had given to them, love, peace, joy, forgiveness, and that touched the lives of the people in that church more than you can ever understand because some church up in that big country called America sent people who would sacrifice their time and finances to help that church. God is faithful for the plans that he had set long ago for each one of us. If you could come, come ushers and we'll open with a word of prayer here. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your plans. We give thanks for your faithfulness for things that uh, certainly we could not have foreseen. We just thank you for the faithfulness of people here and their obedience to the word and that which you have placed in their lives. And we just ask your blessings upon the giver this morning, on the, the blessings upon the gift they receive that may go out into reaches beyond what we could even imagine. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a great day here at New Life Worship Center. If you are new to our church, we encourage you to take a moment and fill out one of the communication cards that are located on the chair back in front of you. If you have any questions regarding any of our ministries, you can open the communication card and on the inside, can check off those ministries you're interested in or those you have questions about. Once again, thanks for joining us for worship today. We have just a few of our extra large and medium sized New Life Worship Center t-shirts available. If you'd like a t-shirt, please see Carol in the back of the sanctuary after the service. On Sunday morning, September 8th, during our worship service, we'll be having a special time of prayer for our students, our teachers, and our families. So we encourage you to be with us on Sunday morning, September 8th, as we take this time to pray for our families. Be 
you know that it was the Girl Scouts that invented the s'mores? Yeah, that's right. In 1927, the Girl Scouts decided to put graham crackers, marshmallow, and chocolate together. And the world has been a better place ever since. We want you to make your own s'mores on September 15th at 6 p.m. We'll be having our backyard bonfire and cookout here at New Life. Bring along a snack food to share with everyone. Bring a lawn chair so you can sit around the fire. It'll be a great night of fellowship with the church family. The 2019 Refuge Youth Network fundraiser is just around the corner. Tickets are on sale by going to refugeyouthnetwork.org. This coming Wednesday at 11 a.m. is our Senior Adult Ministries Fellowship. I encourage you to come on out for a time of praise and worship, a message from Pastor Woody, followed by a great meal. This week's main course is Stuffed Shells and Meatballs. So bring something that goes well with that. Connect, grow, and serve. That's the focus of our life groups here at New Life. We currently have many groups that are meeting. There's our Ladies Life Group, the Shannon Life Group, the Worship Team Life Group. We also have three new life groups kicking off on Wednesday evening. Our Wednesday evening life groups all begin at 7 p.m. Your local foundation is taught by Pastor Wayne. Combating the Darkness is taught by Joy Bickle. And 31 End Time Prophecies is taught by Connie Eisenberg. We encourage you to come on out on Wednesday night. We also have a life group just for the kids, so no reason to stay at home. Bring the whole family out. This okay? Mm -hmm. oh, very, very good. Oh boy, it's about to start! I know. What? Huh? What? I can't hear you! I have a banana in my ear! Ah. I gotta go. Did I do it with Puppy Girl? nothing more than to distract you from what the Lord has for you today. So please, out of respect for everyone around you, silence your cell phone. It's going to be a great day here at New Life Worship Center. As we enter a time of worship now, these altars are open. If you need prayer, just come up and stand in front of the sanctuary and someone will come with you. Or if you just want to spend some quiet time with God, Come up and kneel at these altars. They're open now. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is
cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the Savior you found. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but you brought
the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. A miracle can Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. For the Spirit of the Lord is
singing here the words of the song are powerful Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble it's very easy for us to look into the world that we live in and be discouraged be discouraged by poverty by famine by sickness disease death even, even some that affects us so close to home that, that, we, that we have all of these circumstances and these situations that, that firsthand that, that we experience this fear of things that change in our life. But even when our circumstances change, our God doesn't. And what I love about this song, if you, if you study this song, it, it's so powerful because the darkness is what is supposed to make us tremble. It's supposed to be with the thing that makes us terrified, that scares us. But the, the very thing that we're singing is, is the complete opposite. It's that our God makes our darkness tremble because that's how powerful He is. And, and it's, it says very clearly in Luke chapter one that God's mercy will shine on those living in darkness and will guide us into the path of peace. That's what this song is about. It's about speaking to that darkness that is in your life, whatever it is, however it circumference you. And this morning, there's just such a heaviness that there is so much darkness that we can declare can leave because the peace of God brings us into this situation and light is casted everywhere. So we have to have this understanding that darkness does not need to paralyze us. But in essence, our faith will paralyze the darkness. And that's what we have to have this understanding. So let's sing this one more time through. But let's, let's have this understanding that we do not have to be afraid of what is out there. We do not have to allow these things to happen because God is going to shine a light even on the hidden things that are in our lives to expose everything and show His goodness, His grace, and His mercy even when we don't feel like it's there. Because so many times you can look anywhere and be discouraged. You really can. It does, you can look at anywhere, social media, TV, the newspaper, anywhere can discourage you. But there's also one place that can encourage you, and that is knowing that God is in control. Let's sing this one more time. I'll, just the chorus, we'll go through, and just sing it with this understanding that we will not be paralyzed. Come on, let's sing it out this morning. Let's declare it this morning. Come on, sing it. Let's sing it out this morning. Like sing it like you believe it. You make the darkness tremble. God, this morning, you make the diagnosis tremble. The diagnosis that is, that is in this family that is causing havoc, you make that tremble in fear, and that is released. So God, whatever that diagnosis of sickness and disease is this morning, it trembles in the name of Jesus. And we declare healing now in the name of Jesus. Physical healing in the name of Jesus. God, whatever the finances are right now that seem to be so intimidating, God, you are a provider of all things. So God, we speak provision into that situation. And God, and we say that that, that doubt and that fear of finances will tremble in the name of Jesus. 
God, I pray for broken relationships this morning that seem that can never be restored. God, you are the restorer of all things, of all men. So God, I pray for that relationship this morning, that we speak to that, and we, we speak into that relationship, God, that just as the prodigal was brought back, that prodigal son or daughter, that prodigal mother or father is going to come back. And we will rejoice because then you and the household shall be saved. So God, we speak to that this morning. But God, I just, I just speak into this, into this room, God, into the atmosphere that is here. That the situations that are here, the heaviness that is here, that which was brought here now will be released in the name of Jesus. And God, that we will not, we will not tremble in fear, but we will tremble in awe and wonder of how great that you are, how awesome that you are, God, and the majesty of who you are will be the very thing that changes us. So God, I pray, Heavenly Father, this morning that you change us, that you challenge us, that you renew us. God, that you will not allow us to leave with the same thing, in the same storm, seeing the same way as we came in. But God, we will, we will leave, God, with peace, knowing that you've made a way through the storm, you've made a way through the situation, you've made a way through that diagnosis, you made a way through that doubt, because you are in control. God, I pray, Heavenly Father, that we will stop playing defense and start playing offense. That we will become very, just God, that we will become barbaric in our faith, Heavenly Father. That, that we will not longer be passive, but there will be aggressiveness to us declaring goodness, declaring light into darkness, declaring peace into chaos, declaring healing into sickness. God, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will allow that to rise up inside of us. God, I thank you for what you're doing and I thank you for what you plan to do in this place. God, I pray that you prepare our hearts and our minds. God, allow us to hear from you. God, allow us just to be open to know what you have called us to. And we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. You may be seated this morning. I don't know about you, but I'm fired up. I don't know, there's, there is so much for us to be distracted by. Oh yeah, children, you, you're more than welcome to go head over to Kids Church. Um, there is so much for us to be distracted by that we lose our focus of what God has called us to. And a lot of times what I'm learning in my walk with the Lord is that the enemy doesn't need me to sin he needs me to be distracted. And if I'm distracted from the things that are, uh, uh, that are going on and what God has called me to, then he has me. Because when our focus is off the glory of God and who he is and what he can do, it will cause us to then focus on other things. And that's why that, that song is so important. And when we sing these songs, these songs are, are, are prophetic songs that we're singing. They're songs of truth that we're singing. All we're doing is singing about the character of God. All we're doing is, is singing about the truth of the word of God, of who he is and who he tells us that we are. And so um, I, I just want you to remember that, that you know, I, I shared this at the other church a couple weeks ago. When we sing, it is not a glorified karaoke experience. But that's what, but we treat it like that. Some of you are like, who's karaoke? And I hope nobody's karaoke, and I'm not karaoke. But we come into worship, and, and we, we feel like this is just an experience where we read these words off the screen. And can I tell you, if we stripped all of this away and had nothing, and didn't have the instruments, and didn't have the words on the screen, and just had us, our voice should be enough to proclaim the glory of who God is through worship. And, and we have to stop being programmed into this understanding that we are coming into worship and it's just a thing that is part of the service. This isn't part of the service, this is part of your life. This is part of what you do to grow closer to God each and every day. And we have to have the understanding that worship is so much more than what we make it. And we have to understand that through worship and through that declaration of us worshiping, just the identity of who God is, that is what brings forth healing into your life. That is what brings forth the provision in our life. It's not just words on a screen that we repeat and that we say and that we clap our hands to, but it's something that we declare that changes everything. It literally changes the atmosphere. It changes, it changes how we view things. And the Bible says that God abides in the praises of his people. 
And if, you, and if you want that in modern terms, God hangs out in your praises. So it literally his spirit comes down and it, and it hangs out and hovers over us when we declare the goodness of God. And so I wanna encourage you through worship. Worship is one of these things that is an honor to participate in. That we have this glory and this honor to be able to worship God in such a powerful way. And so, um, yeah, that's it. Um, uh, my name is uh, Micah. I'm the youth pastor here at the church. Pastor Wayne is, is traveling this week. Um, he's on a well-deserved, well-needed vacation to refresh, to be able to come back and to be able to lead us and guide us uh, and, and continually just take us to where uh, God wants us to be a part of. And so he had asked me to fill in and speak, and I said, absolutely. Um, I have no, no problem with that. And so we are going to continue on in this series on change that uh, Pastor Wayne has been uh, setting us up for and kind of building the foundation for. And I, I, wanna, I just want to ask you a question to open up this morning. Do you know anyone in your life that has a hard time with change? Okay, you're, you're not supposed to point at the person, all right? That like some of you are like pointing, other you are pointing at yourself. That, that change is something that, that, is, that is very difficult. Um, and, and change is one of these things that is so uh, real in our lives because we live in a society that things are constantly changing. We have change happening all of the time in our life. And uh, you know, people, it, it's hard to get people to change things. When, when you have a habit, it's hard for people to change. Like think about what you like to eat. And then all of a sudden your doctor tells you you can't eat that anymore. But you've always, you've always had that. And it's hard to change that, that, that mindset of eating that way because you always, always have had that and enjoy that. Or, or think about it this way, you gotta you got you got change the way you drive to work. I don't know about you, but, I, but there's something about driving that just brings out some type of like aggression in people sometimes. Um, because there are things called turn signals which we need to learn to use sometimes. There's this thing called a speed limit which you're supposed to go. Um, and there's all these things that I get, I get very, you do not want to drive with me. Trust me, you can ask my wife, you do not, if we're, if we're lost or whatever, but when I have a certain way of getting to somewhere and then all of a sudden it changes, I get really frustrated because I get so used to going the same way, knowing how it works. Or think about it, think about it this way. Um, the, the way that you have always treated people or the way that you've always uh, adapted to th certain situations, you've always had that one way that you've been and now you have to change it because of circumstances and situations. We know this, that life is full of change. If you don't believe it, go and stand in front of a mirror. I'm gonna tell you this right now. Like years ago, I had this nice jet black hair. It was all jet black, it was nice. Then all of a sudden, I'm standing in front of the mirror last week and I got this salt and pepper thing going on. And I'm like, what, what is happening to me? And, and I, I got reminded that I work with teenagers for a living, so a lot of that is, is due to that. And I can actually show you who did what where on, on, on my head. And that's why I, I started cutting my hair short because of that. And, and as you get older, you probably realize that like sometimes your hair changes by, by your hand or by, by nature's hand, depending on what's happening. And, and change is one of these things where we look and we're like, what is, what is going on? Things are changing and, and change is happening but change is inevitable. There are going to be seasons of extreme change in your life. There's going to be things that come in, whether good, bad, easy, or difficult, whatever it might be, change is going to happen. And we have to ask, have this understanding that change is always a challenge. Change is always a challenge. Now there's little things that you can change here and there. You can change this, you can change that. But then sometimes there are major things that change in your life that are very difficult to adapt to. They're very hard to adapt to. You've lived life all, your, all these years up to a certain point and now you have to change the way that, the way that you live and the way that things are. And so um, this morning we're gonna talk about what happens when there is such an amount of change in your life. What do you do? What, what happens? So if you have your Bible this morning, which I hope you do, open up to the book of Daniel. And uh, we're gonna start in Daniel chapter one and we're just gonna kinda hang out there for this morning. Um, so while you, are, while you are flipping over to Daniel chapter, uh, chapter one, I kinda wanna just set up uh, where we are going to be going uh, with this this morning. Um, what, what really is interesting to me is that the, the book of Daniel, when we discover this and jump into this, we are actually looking at a teenage boy. 
which is so fascinating to me because living in teenage culture and working with teenagers, it, it's so interesting to me to be able to have this understanding that there is a teenage boy that we are going to, to discover how he is, the way he thinks and the way he operates, and how, how he is able to, uh, to, to deal with that. And some of you, how many of you have ever dealt or had a teenager or have a teenager or dealt with teenagers? Anyone? How many of you? Okay, when a teenager makes up their mind about something, it can be very difficult to change their mind. Very difficult. And sometimes that's a bad thing, but sometimes it's a very good thing. And what I want to look at this morning is I want to look at the mindset of this young man. So Daniel chapter 1, we're going to jump into verse 3, and that's where it's going to start this morning. It says, Then the king ordered uh, Asphias, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, who were young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every type of learning. They were well informed quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. And so here what we have is we have that the Babylonian empire has taken over, and uh, for a period of years, they're gonna be in charge of this region. And, and you have this young man, of the, these group of young men who are in the city, who, are, um, who the Babylonians look at them and say, we need them to be part of us. We actually need them to become us. And so they see these young men, and, and it said, the Bible is very clear. I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, okay, so they gotta be, uh, they gotta be attractive, they gotta be smart, they gotta be willing to learn. These are like perfect tens. I'm just, I'm gonna tell you, these are perfect 10 guys. These are like guys that are like, these are the guys that you want on your team. These are the guys that you want around. These are the guys that you want to, to basically be your promo. That you, it, when people look at you, you want these group of guys, because they, they are the best in the city and they are so well adaptive to, to anything. And so you have this group of young men that the Babylonians are saying, we need them to become us. Because if they become us, then they'll be able to teach our ways, our culture, how we live, who we worship, and we can preserve our culture of the Babylonians and how we are as people. If we can preserve our culture um, then by, by bringing people and assimilating them into our way of life, then we can further our kingdom, and we can continually do that. So we're at this place where there is this change that is happening uh, in, in this area where this culture at this time, they're the dominant race. They are, they, they they're considered extremely intelligent. They're, they're considered extremely wealthy and, and um, extremely uh, well-versed in, in studying history and culture at that time. And so they, they wanted the best to fit with them. And so the Babylonians bring in all of these young men. And then we jump down and we find that verse five, this is what it says. It says, the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were entered into the king's service. So basically the king says, all right, we're gonna put them through a training program. Um, I don't know if any of you had to ever do a training program through work or, or whatever you might be doing. So the king said, listen, bring these, all of these young men, these perfect tens, bring them through, and we're gonna put them through our training program, and we're basically going to uh, teach them our ways of culture. We're going to teach them who we are, and we're not only going to teach them to be like us, we're also going to change their diet, and we're gonna change what they eat so they can look like us as well. Because back then, they were, they were smart enough to understand that the diet had a way of affecting the way that you looked. And so they knew that if they, if they had these young men eat the same food and drink the same wine that they did, then they would be able to be used in the king's service. Which is very interesting is that the kings back then, they had training programs that you had to go through or preparation seasons that you had to go through in order to sit before them. We understand this in the book of Esther. Esther had to go through a preparation period before she could ever sit before the king. And, and as I'm reading this, this the last few weeks, I'm very thankful for one thing. I am thankful that we do not have to go through a preparation period to be seen by our king. I'm very thankful that God does not require us to look a certain way, act a certain way, talk a certain way, live a certain way in order for us to be accepted into his presence. Our king is very gracious with us where he's saying, listen, come as you are, I, I don't, I, like however you are, and come into my presence and be part of who I am. And, and that was a shift of culture that we saw that as, as the Old Testament went into the New Testament and Jesus came forward, Jesus kind of messed everything up the way that they thought, the way that they lived, and saying, listen, like, you can go before God just as you are. 
You can go just as you are. You don't have to do a sacrifice anymore. You don't have to spill blood, anything. I'm gonna do all that for you. You can just come before me. But back in this time period, you had to go through a preparation season in order to, to do this. But what's interesting is, is one thing in this passage. It said, that they had to be trained for all of those years for the daily amount of food and drinking wine from the king's table. And, and I just, curiosity got to me. And I said, okay, what is the difference between wine from the king's table and wine? Just regular wine. Like, what's the difference? Why do they have to drink wine from the king's table? Well, what I found out is that the wine from the king's table was actually wine that was blessed by Babylonian priests and a sacrifice unto their gods. And so in order for you to be in the king's presence, you had to be partakers of something that was sacrificed to something else. So the wine was already being sacrificed and was given to this false god, and this is the wine that they wanted you to drink. And as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, this is very interesting that the mindset was that if we drank the wine that was dedicated to this idol, it would then enhance the intelligence and it would enhance who that person was because that was the belief. That if the wine that we've given to the idols If we drink of that, then we will be better. So we have to sacrifice this wine unto unto this God. And it's so interesting, the parallels. Our God is the sacrifice, and our God is the wine. We don't have to bring anything to him because he is that wine that we drink. And so just these parallels that I'm seeing, but, but in order for all of this to happen, this change in this story is that there needed to be a change in who these young men were. So change happened, they, they, the captivity happened, these people came in and they said, listen, we need, our, we need to change who you are in order for you to be accepted by the king. So there was this change uh, that was coming where it, everything had to change. If these young men were picked, they had, to, they had to dress different, they had to learn different, they had to speak different, and all of these things had to change uh, where they were and who they were. Because we find out in Daniel chapter one some of the names of these young men in verse six. It says, among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official now gave them new names. Daniel, he gave them the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Meshach, or to Michelle, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Well, we're very familiar if you were raised in church culture of these names, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Those are the dudes that were in the fiery furnace that, you know, here down the road here in Daniel, we'll find those were the guys in the fiery furnace. But these guys were all connected to Daniel. Daniel and all of his friends were, were part of this group that was brought into uh, the Babylonian empire that said, listen, we have to change who you are. And by giving them new names, the king actually believed that he would blot out their name and their existence and their relation to Jehovah, which was the God of Israel. Because this king, wasn't, this king wasn't stupid. He was actually pretty smart. If he, can, he said, if I can get rid of their name, their name is connected to their legacy. Their legacy is connected to Jehovah, their God. If I can change their name, I can change their legacy. I can change the, the belief that, of who they are. And so what's interesting is, he thought if he changed man's name, he could change their mind. And so I, I looked at this and I thought, okay, so what's with the name change? Why did they do this? And so let me, let me break this down for you this morning. If you want to write these down, this is very interesting. So Daniel's original name was uh, Belshazzar. That name meant God is my judge. Okay, so that's what Belshazzar's name was, God is my judge. His name was changed to Daniel, which meant protect the life of the king. Hananiah's name was changed to Shadrach. Hananiah meant Yahweh is gracious. Shadrach means I am fearful. Mishael's name was changed to Meshach. Mishael meant who is like the mighty one, my God. Meshach means I am despised. Azariah's name was changed to Abednego. Azariah's name meant Yahweh is my help or has helped me. Abednego was changed to servant of Nebo or servant of the chief idol of Babylon. And, I, and, and it's very interesting that some of these are almost exact opposites. Some of them are almost a, exact different identities where the king was like, oh, your name is going to mean this. Well, what, what can I do completely contrary to what the name of who you are is? Because this king really believed that he could change that. And, and, and I began to think about that and how we are. And the world might change your name, but they can never change your heart. 
and, and what I know in my heart is true. And, and I can only imagine going into this as a young man and saying, okay, you're going to change my name from my God is gracious to I am fearful. That, that, uh, that's not gonna happen because I know that my God is gracious and I am not living in fear. So you might try to change my name. You might try to change who I am, but you're never gonna change who and what my heart is and who it's geared towards. How many times do we allow situations to try to change our identity? From once you were once strong to something happens in your life where, where fear is then brought in and you, are go, you go from being someone that is, that is a pillar and strong in your faith to someone that is fearful. Why? Because there's try, the enemy is trying to change your identity. He, if I, he can change your identity and change your name, he thinks he can change your heart. And so what we're seeing here is this interesting concept where this king was like, listen, I am going to go ahead and I'm going to change this and, I, and I, I'm gonna change everything about it. So listen, you can change the environment that you're in. All right, the environment changes, everything changes. You're stuck into a new place, a new city. You have to learn a new culture. Okay, whatever. You change my name. Okay, you can change my culture, but you can change my name, but you're not gonna change my heart. So finally through this story, we're seeing all these changes happen to these young men. And what I have learned about teenagers uh, just over the years is um, sometimes they have more courage than they do common sense. It's just one of those things. And, and, and what we find here though is these young men at this point said, okay, enough's enough. Enough's enough. Because you, you can continually change my location of where I'm at. You can, can change the exi- like what my name is. But as we move forward, we're going to see that they tried to change something else. And that's when these young men said enough's enough. And what that tells me is that we have to get to a point where if we have all of these changing happening in our world, we have all these changes happening in our lives, we have to get to a point when we say enough's enough. We do, we, we, we really need to understand that. We have to get to this point that says, listen, you might change where I'm at, you might try to change who I am, but, but enough is enough because you will change all these things, but you're not gonna change what I do. You're not gonna change what I do. Because what I'm doing is living for God, what I'm doing is serving God, and I'm, I'm living for him and I'm loving him. And the, 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 the passage gets really interesting here. So the king orders them to live this certain way for three years, he changes their name, and then it says in Daniel chapter one, verse eight, Daniel's had enough. He's like, enough's enough, because this is what it said. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with royal food or wine, so he's not drinking the wine. He says, no, that wine is dedicated to something else, someone else, I'm not, I'm not doing that. And he asked the chief official for permission to not defile himself in this way. Um, other versions say that Daniel had made up his mind. Other versions say that, that Daniel had already understood what could happen. Because if you think about it, these guys really had to make three really purposeful decisions every day. They had to take part in a pagan education, which they probably knew was not true. So they had, to take, they had to go through this educational system for three years knowing that, okay, this is not true and it might be completely contrary to what I believe. He had to be put up with, calling, with being called a pagan name. And then he was called to eat pagan food. At that point, he's like, you know what? This isn't happening. I'm, I'm not going to partake in what is, what is being put into me because I value what I have inside of me. And we have to have this understanding that you, we need to learn to value what's inside of us We need to value what God has called us to. Our faith, what we believe, has to be something that is of value to us. Because if I can just be honest with you this morning, is the thing that we value most in society is now under attack. The thing that we value most in our faith is something that is completely... uh, under, uh, under attack of, of the enemy and under culture. And, and we, we just have to have this understanding that, that if they would have eaten the food, they would have sold out. If they would have put what was out here inside of them, they would have sold out. It would probably would have ended here. Daniel chapter one would probably only have been Daniel chapter one and that's the end. Because if they would have partake in the food and they partake in the wine, all of a sudden what you have is you have, what, you have, you have assimilated everything in culture inside of you. And what I'm understanding is we are not, the Bible says you cannot conform to the ways of this world, to the image of this world. But you're transformed by the renewing of your mind which is done inside of you. And the only way that you can be constantly transformed into who you are is by reading the word of God, by spending time in his presence, by being rooted alongside others that are, that are at a place that you wish to be. 
You know, we, we hear a lot in the church, we talk a lot about fathership and mentorship, but there needs to be something about son and daughtership that's taught as well. That is very important that we are under people and we're being mentored people, and I don't care how old you are, we can always learn from one another. And so we need to be rooted alongside one another so that we can constantly say, hey, do not put this inside of you. This is not something that needs to be inside of you, that needs to be placed within who you are. And so having this understanding that, you know, to eat together, when you, I love to eat. Eating is one of my favorite things to do. Love to eat. We just had a dinner the other night. We were there, and they had a ton of different types of food there. And someone came up and asked me. They're like, well, what'd you have? I said, all of it. <laughs> then I know if it's all good or not. But think about this, when you go to eat with someone or you partake in eating with someone, um, whether you, you're doing it after service or whatever, or whatever it might be, you're inviting people over, to, to eat together implies um, you're, you're, you're into a, you're basically fellowshipping with somebody. Food is, a very, food is a very important thing. It's a very spiritual thing, actually, too, that we find within the Word of God, that when you have fellowship with one another, you're, you're, you're basically there with one another, and whether, whether it's in cooperation, whether it's because of values, whether it's because of resolve, whatever it might be, when you are eating with someone, you are in that. And, and in the end, Daniel could obey the king and um, even serve in his government. He could even go through all the classes. He could do all these things, but the one thing that he could not do was eat the food, because that situation situation would have put him in a place of moral compromise of everything that Daniel believed. And it's funny that, that we talk about this because my wife and I have been talking a lot about this recently, compromise. Compromise is very dangerous. And so often we, we, we don't realize the intensity of what compromise can do to someone and where it can put you. And at this point, I would rather remove compromise from any situation or aspect of my life and not have to apologize for it. Because you don't have to apologize for things you don't do. And if I don't participate within a certain situation and mindset that has to do with compromise and I remove the possibility of compromise being placed in this situation, then I'll never be questioned for it. And Daniel understood this. Daniel understood, like, listen, I cannot put my faith in who I am. I can't put myself in a compromising situation. I can't allow myself to be eating with the king and then people look at me thinking that I was this leader that was helping them and leading them. Because he knew, like, I cannot morally put myself into that situation. Therefore, he made up his mind that he would not do it. That's such a powerful statement that he resolved, he thought about it, he put it in his mind that, listen, I am not going to do this. Because Daniel understood, you can change the culture, you can try to change my character, but you'll never change my nature. My nature is to constantly be serving God. My nature is to constantly be, be, be behind this aspect of, of always um, going forward and asking God, what does he want from me? And if, if we flip this around and ask, what, what, okay, so what's he gonna eat then? What is he gonna do? How is this going to work? Like, we're already in captivity. Um, what, what difference does it make if I eat of the food? What difference does it make? Like, is this really gonna make such a big difference? We can eat it and we can just, you know, go along with it and we can just, again, compromise. And trust me, sometimes compromise is easier to do than to go along with what you're asked to do. Sometimes giving in to weakness is so much easier than it's standing with strength. It really is. And so here you have these young men where, you know, it might have been easier for them to be like, dude, Daniel, just eat. Just eat this food. Quit messing around, don't make us look bad. If we just eat of this food and we just partake in what we are called to, God, God's gonna understand. God, God gets it. People, you know, people will think you know, I'm this way or I'm that way, so just eat of the food and, and God will understand later. Uh, and, and you look at that and you're like, okay, I can understand that because of, of being in compromise some point in my life. I can understand where it's easier just to give in than it is to fight. I can understand where it's easier just to do what I need to do and should be doing rather than what I know is right. And so he's in this situation, and, and he, but the Bible says that he resolved in his mind. What does resolve mean? Resolve means that he had already made up the decision in his mind if something were to happen, what he were to do. And I think that there is a, a real spiritual discipline that we can learn from that. That part of the spiritual disciplines is already knowing the answer if the question is going to be asked. Already knowing what you will stand for or what you will not stand for when the question is asked. Resolving it within your spirit and your heart knowing that I already know what is going to, I know what I'm going to do. 
I know what is right. And I'm going to stand on what is right. I'm going to make this happen. That, that is made up. He couldn't decide for anyone else, but he decided for himself what he would do, and then that changed everything. I don't know if anyone tried to convince him otherwise, but the Bible says that he made up his mind this is what he was going to do. And, and the way that I think about this is Daniel had influence over all of those that were around him. So if he made this decision, they're going to make the decision. Because they were loyal to following where their leader was going. And Daniel was loyal to following after God and hearing from God. So there was a group of people that were following him as well as he followed God. And you know, Jesus said, follow me as I follow my Father in heaven. Follow what I'm doing. So what that tells me again is that while I am following in all the aspects of change in my life, I need to be able to follow God because I got people that are following me. And I can either lead them to God or I can lead them to compromise. As a Christian, you have influence no matter you want it or not, you have it. As soon as you proclaim Christ as your savior, as soon as you proclaim to live a Christian life, you automatically become a leader. And leader, leadership's hard, it's not easy being a leader. It is not at all. It's not easy being a Christian in today's society either. It's not these easy things, but as soon as you proclaim that, you will have people that will look to you and will, and will look at you as a model of the way things should be, the model of Christianity, the model of, of how and who you are. And so as you do that, you can either lead them in this path saying, okay, like if I'm making the right decision, all of you are making the right decision. If you have a team, like you do this, and, and you learn as you grow around people that there are people that respect what you say, respect what you believe, and they will go along with it, not because they don't have a mind to think for themselves, but because they believe that you are hearing from God and that you are in their life to help lead them. And so we have to be very careful where we're leading people because change can influence us in such a way that causes us to go into a place of compromise. So if we resolve in our heart and our mind first, we will, we will always have the answer to what happens when it comes to compromise. And let's, let, let me kind of use it this way. The way, that, the way that I think the best I can put it is this. Let's think about the way that we are living and believing and walking out Christianity in today's society. If my spiritual life affects my thinking and my life with other people, then there will be pressure to change the way that I am. Because we really understand that our culture is redefining words that matter to our faith. Our culture is, is redefining what marriage looks like. Our culture is redefining what a, what a healthy household looks like. Our, our culture is redefining what a faith looks like. The Bible prophesied that this would happen. It prophesied that we would get to a place where things would change and what sin is now has, has changed. What Forgiveness is now has changed. And so we have all of these things that have changed and, and culture will begin to dictate to us how we need to live and how we need to change the way that we are because it, offense is huge now. Offense is huge. You probably just got offended that I said offense is huge because that's the type of world that we live in. Offense is one of these biggest things, that one of the big things right now. If, if, if I offend you, then I have to change everything about my faith and my culture. If my, if my belief system offends you, then you're going to sue me. If my belief system uh, offends you, then you're going to try to shut me down or do this. Why? Because culture is trying to shift what we believe in who we are. Especially with Christianity. Because Christianity is offensive. I mean, trust me, no one likes to be told that they're doing wrong. No one likes to be told that they're not living the right life. I mean, nobody likes those things. But it's not about liking those things and, 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 and being offended. It's about living the right way. Because sin is still sin. Wrong is still wrong. Right is still right. Regardless of what the world and culture will say to us, there's a thing called absolute truth. Absolute truth means that it's always going to be true and always has been true. And the absolute truth that we have as Christians is the word of God. That's what defines what we believe. But again, culture is trying to shift and change what we believe as Christians and move us away from the word of God. So we have to resolve within ourselves to say that I will not be moved because culture tells me to move. That you might try to redefine my words and you might try to redefine my faith, but you'll never redefine my Jesus. And that's what we have to understand. Daniel got this. And it's interesting that, that like, the, the timeline of history, it's more like it just repeats itself. 
And we, like, things that we deal with, we're like, man, they, like, they, it's crazy. Can I, this was crazy. What Daniel was living in was crazy. The culture that he lived in. We think that the world is so messed up. Hello, have you ever read about Sodom and Gomorrah? Like, that place was messed up. And so there's always going to be sin. There's always going to be darkness. There's always going to be compromise. But there's always got to be those two that stand for what they believe. Because Daniel got brave. And he said, you know what? I've made up my mind. In Daniel chapter 1 verse 12, he says this. Test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with the young men who eat the royal food. And, and treat yourselves in accordance to what you see. So then the, the captain of the guard ag- agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. Daniel's pr- proposal was like very simple. And you read it and you're like, this was very simple. Not very spiritual. And you read it and you're like, give us nothing but vegetables and water to drink. That sounds terrible. Okay, can we just be honest? That sounds absolutely terrible. He asked that he and his friends be taken off this, you know, don't have to eat this diet, but they can do this diet. And at the end, the captain of the guard could compare them and say, hey, okay, yeah, you're right and, and you're wrong. So it tells us that they did this that you have all of these other guys that are eating of the king's food, drinking the king's wine, having all of this, and then you have these guys that are just eating vegetables and water. And after those 10 days, guess what happens? Their appearance was better to the captain of the guard than the ones that took of the king. Because this is what I know. I know that God blesses those who make up their minds to honor him. That's the fact. That God will bless those who have made up their minds to honor him. Can I tell you that it wasn't about vegetables and water? It was about honor. It was about doing the right thing. And that's what changes, that, that's the change that Daniel said, listen, this is what we're gonna do. And God honors that. God will always honor the heart of those that are trying to honor him. It's one of those, it's one of those simple things that are so powerful that we have to have those understandings. And one of the lessons that we learn in this passage, it's not, that, it's not who you are, where you are, um, and all these different things, but what matters is that you're faithful to what God has called you to to living the, Christ, living the righteous life, living a Christian life, following after what God has. No matter what is changing in your life, you are staying consistent. Why? Because you've resolved within your heart and within your mind to live according to Christ. You know, Jesus li- died in, for everyone everywhere. And so with this concept of Jesus doing this for us, he didn't have caveats or areas that he said, hey, listen, if you do this, then my death doesn't cover you. There was never none of that with Jesus. He didn't, he didn't put a list of, comp, of a list of rules and guidelines that says, if you qualify, then you can receive forgiveness from my Father. No, he wasn't like that. He didn't say that you had to do all of these things in order to, to be that. And so what I've come to is we have to remain faithful in all things. We cannot not allow the pressure of the world to change what we know because can I tell you that change doesn't have to change you. It doesn't have to change you. I was, I was laying on the couch last night going over this reading and just discovering more and, and all of a sudden it just dropped in my spirit that with all of the change that happened in Daniel's life, he did not have to change. The heart of who he was does not have to change. Why? Because he knew that I have to be faithful to what God has called me to. You have to be faithful to what God has called you to. It's so important. But the change of everything in, the, in, in, in his life in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, read the rest of Daniel. It, it's wild. The story just gets wild. You have, you have the fiery furnace. You have, you have Daniel thrown in the lion's den. You have all of these things that come against these young men. Why? Because of this. So can I tell you that change doesn't have to change you, but change will challenge you. Because from this point forward, the rest of the book of Daniel, these guys go through hardships, they go through tough times, but the one thing they always are is faithful. They're faithful in the fiery furnace. Daniel's faithful in the lion's den. They're always faithful to God. Why? Because they know it is truth. They know it is what they need to do. And so I want to encourage you this morning, in a culture that is constantly changing, in a world that is constantly changing, Always remain faithful to what God has spoken to you. Always hold on to the fact of of your identity as a son or daughter of God. And and don't forget that. Don't forget what Christ has done for you. I think even with Christianity, it's so easy for us to forget. Because Christianity can become so routine that it's not real. 
because we just do the same thing over and over again. And what happens is, when you do something for so long, you lose meaning of what it really is about. And this whole thing of Christianity is about living for one that died for us, that gave his life for us. Probably nobody in this room will ever give their life for Jesus, as in death, like physical death. But Jesus gave his life for every one of us in this room. And that has to be a sobering thing that we have an understanding of what God can do and who God is in our life. And as, we, as, as you read the rest of the book of Daniel, you're going to discover that there are so many things that, that we can just learn just from this young man and his friends and how they were faithful. I mean, and, and it is so encouraging to know that change doesn't have to change me. That I can stay rooted within the word of God and who he was. If death didn't change Jesus, then my situation doesn't need to change me. Death couldn't even hold him down and change who he was. The devil actually believed that he had won. He believed because Jesus died, he believed that he had won. He had believed that it was finished, it was done, he's got it, he had won. What he did not understand is that that was, that was only the beginning of what Jesus was going to do, was resurrect and bring freedom and bring relationship to all of us so that we could know who our Father is and be connected to him. Worship team, if you'll come. Um, I just want us to have this understanding this, this morning and this encouragement this morning. I hope that you're encouraged. I hope that you, that, you are, uh, that you have something in your spirit that you don't have to change who you are just because everyone tells you to. I mean, could I be nicer sometimes? Absolutely. Could I do things a little bit differently? Yes, but I'm not talking about those changes. I'm talking about the change of the identity of who you are as a son or daughter of Christ. I'm talking about the identity of being a Christian and what God has called you to and what he has commissioned you to. And so I, I pray this morning that, that this is something that encourages you, that, that as our culture continually shifts and changes, as we continually see us in a timeline progress to things, that, that sometimes we look at it and we're like, man, it's just getting worse and worse. It is getting, it just, the, it's just getting more bad as we progress on. Well, can I tell you that if you are seeing something that is getting more bad or something that is getting worse, what are you doing to facilitate change to make it better? Because we can, we can look at culture and say, man, it's just getting so bad. Well, then what are you gonna do about it? Because just as the same people that are out there and the same things and the same principalities and spirits that the Bible says is in control of this world, the same, the, the same plan that they have, the same cycle that they're going in, the same idea that they're having to destroy our world, we can actually combat that by the power of the Holy Spirit saying, God, like, no, I refuse to allow things to get any worse. I refuse to allow them to be that way. Things don't have to be this way. We just allow them to be this way because we don't understand that we have the power to change them. And I do say we because the Bible says that through the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you, we are connected to the, the power and the presence. And the same strength that Jesus had to cast out demons and proclaim uh, miracles and freedom is the same power that he's given us. So this isn't a him thing, it's a we thing. It's not a me thing, it's a we thing. Because we're connected with what God has called us to. But if we want things to change, we have to be those to facilitate it. We have to be the intercessors that allow prayer to be released. We have to be the ones that worship, that allow worships to be released. We have to be the ones that proclaim, that allow the word of God to be released. We have what, we have what, it, what it's needed to not just change the church, not just change the community, but to change everything. But we need Christians to realize that just because everything else is changing doesn't mean that you have to. Let's pray. God, I'm so thankful for your faithfulness to us. That God, that you are one that is faithful to, to, to be there for us, to love us through all of our mess sometimes. And God, the one thing that remains constant is you. It's your promises. It's your word. And so God, I pray that as we walk through culture as we continually to progress through a, a changing culture, a changing world, things that are, are constantly being uh, shifted left and right and upside down and inside out. But God, through all of these things, the one thing remains is that we can remain constant in you. That your promises are yes and amen. <laughs> that God, the things that you've spoken to us 
will remain. So God, I I speak over this body of of believers this morning. God, and even if someone is in here that doesn't believe in you, I pray that right now they will have an understanding that you sent your son Jesus to die for them. And you might be in here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus into your heart. You've never accepted him into your life. You've never, you've never partaken in that. I wanna encourage you this morning. Um, I'm gonna pray here in a minute and I pray that you just uh, walk alongside me as I pray. Just speak alongside me because I'm gonna tell you, Jesus is the greatest thing that will ever happen to you. And to be honest, the the answer to follow Jesus is the easiest answer you'll ever say, yes or no, but it's the hardest thing you'll ever live out. But no one promised us that this would be easy. But we were promised it would be worth it. And so this morning, if you don't know who Jesus is, I want to encourage you to open up your heart and open up your mind. Also, if you're here this morning and you're, you've allowed just the, the, the constant changes that have been happening in your life, whether personal or outside of it, if you've allowed those changes to affect you to a place of compromise, to a place of discouragement, to a place of loneliness, to a place of depression, I want you to know this morning that God can carry you out of that place. That he, he can lift you out of that. And all it is is, all it is, is a focus thing. We look our eyes up to see where our help comes from and our help comes from the Lord. So we're able to just just move our eyes from our our, our situation that is happening and focus on Him. And in that, the change that is around us doesn't have to affect a change inside of us. And so God, I pray this morning that as we're here this morning on a Sunday, we came in here not knowing you having no understanding about you. But God, if we're here this morning, I pray that we can come into a relationship with you. God, I pray that you'll come into our heart and you allow your Holy Spirit to live inside of us. And God, that you will help us to understand that we need forgiveness and so that we ask you to forgive us for the things that we have done. God, I pray that as we seek your forgiveness and we we seek that, that we realize that we're gonna do the best that we can to not make the same mistakes again that we're gonna do the best that we can. We're gonna try our hardest to not fall into that same cycle of doing the same things over and over. And God, if we, as we ask for forgiveness and as we ask for, for strength, God, that we will ask for an awareness to always know to do what's right. That we will get into the word of God, that we will get into prayer, that we will get into groups that will constantly help us grow in who we are as Christians. So Jesus, come into our life. God, I pray for the ones that are here this morning that are discouraged because of all of the change. God, that they're, they're depressed because of all the change. They're confused, they're compromised because of all of the change. God, I pray that we will be rooted now within the word saying that I don't have to change just because everything else is. I pray for a spirit and a mindset of resolve to be within us. That we will resolve not to change who we are in you that we will not change the identity that we have. Being adopted into your family, being part of the kingdom of God. So God, I thank you for these things. I pray that you will continue to allow us to have this understanding, God, and that we will continually follow after you in all that we are and all that we say and all that we do. God, change us, challenge us, renew us in all things of your spirit. God, we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet one more time. And we're gonna sing that song, Tremble, one more time. And we're gonna sing it with this understanding of being rooted and having a mindset that was resolved that I will not let these things affect me. I will not let darkness change me. I will not let storms, the storms that surround me, I will not let it, I, I will declare the faithfulness of Jesus in our heart.
goodness we proclaim who you are God I just thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for us so that we could be set free and know you in spirit and know you in truth and God I pray that as we go today we go knowing who you are and what you do and all the things that that you've given to us and bless us with and God that we will continually seek first your kingdom that your kingdom will be the primary thing. Relationship with you will be the primary thing. And then all of the things that follow will bless us. So God, I pray that as we leave today that you bless us, you go with us. God, let your peace go with us, Lord. I pray that you anoint our hands, that anything that our hands touch this week, spread the anointing. Anywhere that our feet go, that the anointing is spread. Anything that we speak to, that that anointing is brought forth. And God, we thank you for these things. We worship you. God, continue to allow us to grow closer to you in all that we say and all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Amen. I encourage you to uh, come back next week. Continue to uh, invite people to come and be part of this. Have a blessed week.